You guys have been around, what, I think 2007 you started. Correct. And you got out on a mission for personalized medicine. It's been more than a decade. What's changed in your thinking and your approach to personalized medicine from then to now? Well, the first thing is, 10 years ago, it was a hope. We now have multiple medicines that have been approved by some of our portfolio companies and that will be approved soon. So it's working. Uh, that's good. That's good. That's great. And it's remarkable how much broader the tool set has become. It used to be traditional drugs. Right. Today it's beyond just traditional drugs. We have gene modifying gene therapies and cell therapies as well. So the tools that you can use to really make these breakthroughs has just matured incredibly. Changed very dramatically in terms of traditional pharmaceutical versus what we can do today or Correct. potentially what we can do today. Correct. How quickly though does all of this, I mean stuff has started to come to market, how quickly though do we start to see really a dramatic disruption in terms of how we treat patients? Well, we're starting to have the first gene therapies approved now, right. and the first cell therapies uh, approved now, when just 10 years ago, they were really sort of a, a sparkle in people's uh, hopes. Right. So that's remarkably quick, and whereas there's one or two today, I think we're gonna be seeing dozens of them over the next 10 years. I wanna ask you about your Relay Therapeutics that you guys are, are you raised a lot of, of money uh, and private capital for um, a biotech from SoftBank and other investors. What's next for Relay, though? Yeah, so it's, it's another major interesting trend at the moment where you're having the life sciences intersect with technology, right. with computational power, with machine learning. And so we're able to just do things today, again, that maybe a decade ago we might have hoped for, but we can actually do them now, which means we can use the computational power in the case of Relay to design drugs against biological targets that we've known we've wanted to create a drug against for the last 10, 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, but we haven't been able to. But now we can, and we can do it really, really quickly. Really has created uh, a drug against a target that we have known in the field has been important for several decades, and Relay was able to do it in the course of two years. Which is remarkable. And before it was impossible. So, okay, so everything goes much more quickly. What's the next step for Relay? Do you, is an IPO soon on the horizon? Well, Relay's been fortunate at the amount of uh, private capital right. that it's been raised, right. so uh, it doesn't have to turn an IPO uh, immediately. I think it's going to move some of its programs forward and scale uh, what it's doing because the potential there is so large. But one can imagine an IPO at some point in the future. I want to ask you what you think the main risks are to the industry right now in terms of biotech, especially when we have a Congress, a Washington, that is really just focused on reducing the cost of health care, specifically reducing the cost of pharmaceuticals. And I think of some of these treatments, they're not going to be inexpensive. So tell me, you know, is that the major risk or is there something else? Well, I think you've put your finger uh, right on it. I mean, it's interesting. We're at a time where we have this technology that's offering truly cures, where we can actually use the word cure. And you're right, they're not inexpensive expensive right. and people are frustrated broadly and, and maybe you know deservedly so to some degree in some ways uh, but in this moment of time you worry that Washington will take a blunt solution or a blunt uh, instrument and cause unintended damage to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. What excites you about biotech right now? Well, it comes back, we're creating cures, for yeah. real. Like it used to be, when I first got into this business, uh, that, that was a word you said softly because you didn't want to lose your credibility. People didn't believe. Today, we actually can. Not for all diseases. Right. There's still a lot, a lot of hard work to be done, a lot of things we don't understand. But where we do, we're beginning to offer therapies, back to that precision medicine, that really make a huge difference for patients. And that's the best thing. No, I think about all the money that you guys have raised, and it says that it affords you an ability with companies to stay private. Um, in terms of returns for investors, are you? can you talk to us a little bit about what kind of returns you, you've seen? So uh, we've been very fortunate at Third Rock. Our first uh, several funds have uh, led the industry and have had just incredible uh, levels of returns. Okay. So. It's been good. It's been doing well. And, yes. it's, and it's ensuring you that more money is coming in. That's correct. Um, it's interesting, too, and I think about um, big pharma and big biotech. They have been pretty active right now, another wave of consolidation. What kind of firms do you think that they're looking for, and where do you kind of watch within the industry that you think will see more consolidation? Well, so there was an interesting statistic uh, that was just recently published that said for new drugs being approved, more than two-thirds of them originate now in small biotech. Right. Which are but hasn't that venture. always been the case? No. 
No, so go back, uh, go back 10 years, go back uh, yeah. 20 years. It was the reverse. Well, actually, 20 years ago, mostly came from large pharmaceutical companies. 10 years ago, it was two thirds from large pharma, a third from biotech. It's now two thirds originated from biotech. And interestingly, another stat: last year, 50% of the new launches were being commercialized by the small companies as well. Right. So I think it shows you that power of the entrepreneurial ecosystem represented here in uh, Kendall Square and MIT. So in terms of like machine learning, AI, the use of data, we're getting smarter with it, more specific. Just got about 30 seconds left. Here. Where does it lead us to in terms of modalities and treatments and how quickly? Yeah, I think that the great power where we take the machine learning and intersecting with the life sciences, hopefully it's going to reveal the places where we don't understand the disease today so we can aim the precision medicine, places like Alzheimer's that we just haven't solved yet. And then two, can we imagine a future where the productivity of the industry is so much higher, instead of having, say, 30 or 40 or 50 drugs approved a year, right. could it be 100 or 200? 